As a multiplayer FPS franchise, Counter-Strike is a series that doesn't need any introduction. With hundreds of thousands of people playing at any given moment, a very low entry barrier and millions to be made in the top leagues, Counter-Strike isn't going anywhere for the foreseeable future. That is, of course, if we're talking about Global Offensive. It's one of the few games that Evolve still actually supports regularly, and it's even getting a major update in the form of Counter-Strike 2. That in and of itself is bringing in plenty more attention, and as of making this video, CSGO hit a new peak of 1.7 million concurrent players. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Instead, I want to step into the past and talk about one of the predecessors to CSGO. No, not 1.6, although it is quite impressive that it still has a following that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And it's not Source either, which has a much smaller fanbase, but is still surprisingly not completely dead. Today, I want to talk about the middle child, Counter Strike Codigen Zero, and the deleted scenes. Condition Zero had a rather troubled development. It went through a few delays, the developing studio changed hands several times, some blame was thrown around, and then the game finally got to release. Originally, the game had a much stronger single player focus, and this is shown in the deleted scenes, a small collection of scripted single player missions that took inspiration from Half-Life and its expansions. They are the main reason that I'm making this video, but I'll save those for later. The main difference between 1.6 and Condition Zero, other than the single player campaign, is mainly in the graphics and the integration of bots. Funnily enough, Source was set to release in the same year as Zero, just a few months later. Perhaps Valve originally and unofficially hoped to replace CS 1.6 with Zero, a bit like they tried and mostly failed with Half-Life 1 and Half-Life Source. Well, that attempt really didn't work out, as these days barely anyone knows about Condition Zero and the game itself is at the complete bottom of the franchise. In fact, if you look up the statistics, the free-to-play ripoff has more players than CZ. So what about the actual game part of the video game? Well, it's Counter-Strike. The formula hasn't changed much. The boss themselves are a mixed bag. Setting them on normal difficulty gives them one brain cell to share between each other, and setting them to one difficulty higher, to hard, makes them ultra pro demigods that will win every match. For the enemy team. All the previous maps are here with some extra new ones, and you can choose between two variations, the new HD version or the old classic one. The newer maps keep the layouts the same, but the textures are different and sometimes the box gets moved. Are they good changes? Eh, I don't know, I kind of prefer the older maps myself. The weapons and player models also received a graphical update and they look quite good. Both games support widescreen and have a decent number of options to mess with, though really, these days even a smart fridge can run a game of old CS. There's two new factions for each side as well, Spetsnaz for the counter-terrorists and the uh, Midwest Militia for the terrorist side. All your favorite guns are present, with their fancy new looks, and the buy menu still has you purchase ammo, which I forgot is a thing in these older games. I forgot to buy ammo. <laughs> and you can still use a tactical shield, which wouldn't appear again until 2019 in Global Offensive. I didn't know about that one, because until I started making this video, the last time I played CSGO just for fun was maybe in 2016. Although, the shield in Global Offensive works a bit differently than 1.6. Personally, not a fan. Another neat addition is the ability to create loadouts. You can have four at a time, name them however you want, and they have an interesting tiering feature. This is something that shows up in Source as well, but strangely enough, not in Global Offensive. You set the highest priority tier, which you want to auto-buy if you have enough money, and then you can go one tier lower and choose what you want if you don't quite have the cash required for your ideal setup. It's a cool feature, though I can see how it wouldn't really matter too much for competitive CS players who can click through the buy menu to get their desired loadout in 0.8 seconds anyway. I'm still giving it bonus points though. Now, let's talk about the solo game that was supposed to be a selling point. As I mentioned before, you can now play by yourself at bots. A good addition for those who suck at multiplayer games, or if you just want to train or test things, but that's not the most interesting part. What's unique is that there's sort of a challenge mode, with a bunch of missions out of certain conditions. You create a profile, select a mission and your teammates who have RPG-like stats, and then play on. There's a bunch of maps, and the objectives change with each one, as does the number of enemies and friendlies. It's an interesting twist on the usual format, and again, this is something that later games are missing. It serves as a good introduction to people new to the game, you tour through all the maps naturally, the complexity ramps up so you're not instantly overwhelmed, and you can switch to a higher difficulty if you want a bigger challenge. 
Of course, you're never going to achieve the same thrill like when you play against real people, but as just a casual time waster, it's pretty fun. Whether you'll finish all the missions is another matter. There isn't a real overarching story, it really is just playing a bunch of maps with some set rules and limitations thrown in there. This is where the deleted scenes come in. Originally, this was the intended vision for CS0. The fact that something like this got to see the light is fascinating to me. When someone says Counter-Strike, you automatically think about a bunch of children and man-children speaking to the microphone in various languages. But this is far from that image. This is an actual, genuine single-player campaign with storytelling and voice acting in Counter-Strike. Incredible. There's quite a few missions to choose from, but you can't select all of them immediately. Instead, more will unlock as you play through them. You select them from the world map, and that sadly didn't survive through the ages. Using a modern widescreen resolution will shift the whole thing in a strange way, and trying to mess about with the video settings more will just crash you to the desktop. You can load into the actual mission just fine, but don't be surprised if you're inserting into the middle of the ocean for your African Black Hawk rescue mission. Also, one quirky thing, the sound options menu now has the HEV sound slider. I have a lot of nostalgia for this game, so I will be working through some biases. But at the same time, I can't help but wonder if the deleted scenes hold up in reality as well as they do in my memory. I remember some of the missions being quite hard, almost unfairly so to a little child me, and I'm interested in seeing how adult me will fare. Ooh, god. Fuck, god damn it, no. Maybe my entire opinion of this game will change by the end of this. There is an optional tutorial mission for you to go through. It's about what you'd expect, it introduces you to the basic stuff like moving around, crouch jumping and shooting, but also some of the more quirky things. Like all the different Rainbow Six style equipment you can use in special areas or the stealth mechanic. That's right, Counter-Strike Stealth. It's not really great as expected. In fact, in one particular mission, I remember it being a complete nightmare. Other than being useful for first time gamers and possibly DSP, you won't learn anything crucial that you haven't already if you've played an FPS game before. I suppose knowing how the stealth mechanic works can be useful for later. It's the strangest addition of them all, for sure. No objective markers, by the way. If you need to use an equipment, then you'll get a little icon. But sometimes you just have to look around the level and figure out where to go, usually by jumping around or pushing box. There were also some weird graphical glitches, but nothing game-breaking, and I wouldn't really expect a game this old to hold up perfectly without some odd things breaking now and then. Now, for the actual missions. Full disclaimer, this isn't going to be a 6-hour walkthrough. It would take far too long to cover each mission in extreme detail step by step. Rather than doing that, I'll be giving a brief overview of what happens and then talk about whatever was memorable, if anything. Essentially, this is going to be one half very light playthrough and second half nostalgia. Off we go then. The mission that starts us off is Recoil. It's inspired by the movie Black Hawk Down, which came out a few years before the game. The mission begins with a helicopter cutscene, there's a bit of military dialogue and then you get shot down. Blam! Title screen. You wake up and get told over the radio to make your way to the evac zone. Here's something I bet you wouldn't expect to see in Counter-Strike, medkits just scattered on the ground. Fighting your way through the streets of whatever this place is called, you eventually end up on a roof with a Delta operative who is also trying to get rescued. In front of him, on a box, is AM60, one of the best guns in the game. This is a good time to mention that you cannot pick up weapons or ammo from dead enemies. This means that you'll be running out of ammo, then you'll find yourself switching guns quite often. Remember, some guns use the same ammo type as well, like the MP5 and the Glock. It never gets to a point where you're just down to your knife, but you might be buzzing out your sidearm more than you think you would. Anyway, the two of you start making your way to evac. Along the way, you come up on a tower, and your sniper friend does what any sniper does in CS and takes up a camping spot. My immersion couldn't be higher. Also, there are suicide bombers. Oh shit. Your sniper buddy tells you to scout ahead. If you take a tiny detour, you can find a little side room with a deagle for you to pick up. It's about as good as you'd expect it to be. There's usually at least one hidden weapon in a mission, sometimes two or more. I'm not really good at scavenger hunts, so I won't be finding all of them, but it's still pretty neat though. You get to the rescue zone, fight a whole of vaguely Arabic terrorists, and then you're told that the elite gamer god has been captured. You run back, see him get dragged off, try to use a smoke grenade to at least pretend to be tactical and fail, and then you escort him all the way back, mission end. If you hit new game instead of the world map, this is the first mission that you start off on. So as a very first introductory taste to delete scenes, it bears talking about it some more. 
Some of the tutorial stuff shows up like you would expect, such as using equipment or escorting people, and it's also quite short, only taking about 10 minutes to finish. For recording purposes, I played this mission and will play every subsequent one, on normal difficulty, as that tends to usually be the way these things are meant to be played on, and perhaps because of this I didn't find the level to be super challenging. The biggest danger here was posed by myself when I threw a grenade at my feet. I did replay the mission on hard, and while the enemies did deal a lot more damage, it still wasn't really all that difficult. All the item placements stay the same, so you're still tripping over medkits and ammo. This will change later. Trust me. It lures you in, making you think it's just a mindless FPS, but eventually you have to learn to play carefully and semi-tactically. You'll see what I mean. The next mission is Lost Cause. I remember this one quite vividly from when I played this as a child. This time, you're part of the German GSG-9 and have to rescue some hostages in the Philippines. It tricks you into thinking it's a stealth mission, but that ends about 30 seconds in. You're going to be fighting in tight, enclosed spaces at close range. Which is why you get an auto shoddy near the beginning. There's Half-Life on explosive trip mines around, and really a whole lot of explosions in general. Explosive barrels that enemies love to stand around, suicide with rushers, and even a few guys with RPGs. Obviously I'd end up killing myself, I mean that was just inevitable. And then I die a few more times, and a few more. I sure missed the desert. I started checking around corners a lot more often, no more ramboing allowed, like it was just a few minutes before. Now then, there's this tiny, 5 second section, which has stuck with me for almost 2 decades. This tiny crawl space has 2 dead bodies that have been brutally disfigured. The detail of the gore is something that isn't found anywhere else in the game, and it's memorable to say the least. I could not get past these into the rest of the level when I first played this. Little boy me thought that these bodies would jump up and eat me or something. I had nightmares about these. What a game. That's about it for Lost Cause. After that, it's just shooting bad men in the hallways with a shotgun. Nothing out of the ordinary. The Toyota pickup drives through the wall at some point, so that's kind of funny. The combat is still fun, but the kid gloves have been taken off. Dying and running out of ammo is now very much possible. I had to switch to my pistol on a few occasions just because I didn't have anything for my primary or because I couldn't reload in time. This would be happening quite regularly from now on. Let's leave the Germans for now. Off to the next mission. Secret War takes place in a cold winter in Russia. You're part of a Spetsnaz group heading to a nuclear missile silo as part of a disarmament procedure. You get there, only to find it under assault by two different terrorist groups. I always like it when multiple factions are fighting each other in video games, so that's some bonus points from me. Nothing traumatic about this one, it's short and to the point, just shooting some terrorists with a heroic sacrifice near the end. And you finish off with a third section. Classic. Next up, building recon. You're part of the SAS in Latvia, investigating another nuke-equipped terrorist group, this one actually has a stealth section, that's probably longer than it should be, but hey, they added a stealth mechanic, so go stealth around a nerd. We could always throw icicles at an intruder. <laughs> <laughs> Once you find a nuke, you get to go loud. The whole mission is about chasing down the terrorist leader who ran off with the warhead. You fight through buildings and alleyways and oh boy there are so many snipers. Oh my fucking god. And a tank. How did the SAS get permission to do airstrikes in a residential area in a city in Latvia, by the way? Oh, and I lied before. It's entirely possible to run out of ammo completely. And I managed to do so right next to the final boss. Luckily, there's an M4 with a bunch of ammo scattered directly in front of him. If that wasn't there, I'd be totally screwed. The nuke is defused just in time. This mission took me about 20 minutes, mostly because I messed up the stealth once or twice. I'm not a fan of stealth sequences or stealth games in general but it honestly wasn't as bad as I remembered it being. Oh, I hit, I hit the fucking... I hit the alarm. <laughs> Next, we have Drug Lab. For once, I don't recall anything about this one. The Navy SEALs are assaulting a drug lab in Colombia. You gotta destroy all the drugs and rescue some hostages. Oh, he's gonna die. You start off with a shotgun. The pump shotgun, which is worse in every way than the auto shotgun. I do like shotguns in video games, but in Counter-Strike they are kind of underwhelming. Not much to say here. You run around a bunch of shacks putting bombs onto red power station things and that disrupts the cocaine somehow. Eventually you find the hostages, shoot all the drug bandits and then escort them out of the door. Mission accomplished. Surprisingly, not a single helicopter goes down. This has been the shortest mission yet, but that's not necessarily a negative thing. Nothing outrageously wrong or great, so let's move on. Motorcade Assault. Assassinate the Terror's leader. Very cool. Here we are in Italy, with a bunch of Germans up to no good. The enemy Terror's also happen to be German. What a coincidence. 
You blew up their convoy, World War II style, and then it's off to chase the flipping leader again. Your commander tells you to follow him and then immediately gets opt. Hilarious. You fight through the hordes of evil badmen through the streets and the sewers of Venice. Eventually, you do find the leader, though he's behind bulletproof glass. Luckily for you, and unluckily for him, there's a stash of grenades right next to said glass. Who put that there? Don't worry about it. So, you blow him up and then run to the extraction boat. Mission end. Really quick this one. Just barely 10 minutes, and that's with me taking a minute or two to make notes while recording. Still fun. Though the friendly soldier at the start just straight up refused to shoot for a good while. This is something that's been happening constantly behind the scenes. The friendly AI just passes out, stands still and either refuses to move, refuses to shoot, or shoots two bullets per minute. And most of those miss. I can't remember if this was a problem when I played it years ago, but I don't think it was. It's entirely possible that one of the updates in the time since 2004 broke something. It's not enough to detract from the game that much, 90% of the time you're alone anyway, and it's not like it's a tactical squad management shooter, then it would be a big problem. But it ultimately makes the friendlies unreliable, to say the least. But anyway, onwards we go. Feel nice. We're the Spetsnaz again. Saving Norway from a nuclear tanker ramming. This is a solo mission. Just you and a boat full of men to shoot. Not much to say in terms of plot, it's basically a ship-based shooting gallery. You do get a generous amount of ammo for the deagle and even get to use the AWP, so that's actually pretty fun. For like 10 seconds. You shoot one man and then destroy the jet with it. I, I op the jet to death. Neat. Also, Castle was in the fridge. Whoever the fuck that is. Next. Down pilot. You're the Germans again. Going to Argentina. Oh no. A helicopter was shut down, so the German police are going in. Sure, why not? You fight through the jungle. Fuck. Then a mine. What the fuck? Oh goddammit. And then a compound. Even though it's actually quite long, there's not much that happens other than, you know, shooting guys. That is a lie. You do get knocked out and captured. Not even for a minute though, you break out almost instantly. All thanks to the help of the skeleton in your cell, who lends you his knife. Thanks, skeleton. None of your friends seem that bothered about your disappearance either. Oh well, that's fine. I don't need friends. They disappoint me. Hostages rescued, mission accomplished. Off we go. Next up is Hankagai, or however you pronounce it. We're in Japan now, and we get to play as a Japanese police, so that's neat. A gang is trying to assassinate a politician. Oh no, the tragedy. Quick, run to safety. You deal with the ambush, that happens, and then, oh god, it's another chase down the leader mission. Japan is all about tight alleyways, so you better get ready to do some hardcore corner checking. And feel free to stop by any of the shops, maybe order some mid-2000 furniture while you're blasting away all the very much not Japanese looking gangsters. So, of course, eventually you catch up to the bad man who took a hostage cool girl and you heroically take him out. Definitely didn't mess up on the first attempt, uh -huh. This operation took me, again, roughly 10 minutes and it would have been only around 8 if you took out all the box pushing and me not knowing where to go, like, 3 times. Also, whatever the hell this floating thing was... What the fuck? Kind of a weak mission actually. The setting is cool, but the bunks puzzles are eh and well they're not even really puzzles, just busy work. And your commander yells at you every 15 seconds. Just shut up. Shut up. I'm trying to figure out where to go. Turn of the crank. From Japan to California. As an undercover cop, you're trying to bust down some drug dealer guy. You make a fake deal and then try to blast his ass, but of course, predictably, he gets away. So you fight through his compound with an AK and then eventually an M60 again. With enough ammo to kill literally the whole planet. I died a few times on this one. There's this ambush that happens in the big warehouse which made me panic once or twice. Stop. 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 Oh my fucking god. 
Jesus. And then there's a final boss himself. Somehow he can tank dozens of 762 to the head. And ultimately, I had to resort to the mega bitch move of standing in the doorway and tapping him in the head very slowly. Another short mission, made longer by the fact that I died several times. Not terrible, and you do get to see a cool briefcase animation, but not much in the way of combat variety. I like the AK and the M60, but it's all you get, and the whole fight takes place in a giant generic warehouse. Well, let's call it a 5 out of 10 and move on. On to LMO in Yippity. You're a Navy SEAL, here to rescue some civilians that have been taken from the US Embassy. You get two squad mates, whom you abandon instantly, and then they die off camera. Very good. You climb through some ruins and shoot a bunch of evil oil merchants. Standard diplomatic procedure for the US of this time, so that's all well and good. Basic, short and simple. There is one odd thing, however, when you rescue the hostages, both of which are women, and get them to the rescue zone, they have thank you lines. Such courage should be reported. Why? Also, I died to this guy like a fucking idiot. What the fuck? Rise hard. I'm having a hard time taking this game seriously. You're the SAS in Ireland. Oh, oh dear. And it's another flipping nuke, of course. Now the bad news. They have a tactical nuclear device and are planning on setting it off in the next two hours. The mission is surprisingly challenging. The shootouts are very intense. There's a lot of enemies around and they're not afraid to rush you. The whole skyscraper office team reminds me a lot of Fear, which is funny because Zero came out before that game did. Hold on, wait. If only you could go into slow motion and roundhouse kick all the Irishmen. I died a few times and got close to death often in general. It's a long one too, probably the longest so far. Oh fuck. Yeah, that's kind of a stupid death, isn't it? And the deaths expect you to fall for it too, because they put an autosave right there. So you fight through the whole building, and near the end, you get ambushed and knocked out. What the fuck? Ow, ow. The leader challenges you to a traditional British knife fight, which he then bitches out on. Very cool. Get back here. You run after him, disarm his nuke, and shoot all his henchmen, but oh no, he has a remote detonator. He really is out of everything. What a shame he decided to hide in a walkway designed by a modern architect. Shut up. And so you blast him off his high horse. Mission complete. The Irish menace has been defeated. Thank you for your service. Well, that's a weird speech to have, but that's fine. Oh. Oh. Credits. It's... it's over. Yeah, you just get the credits now. But there's still six missions left on the world map. That's one third of the game that we're just skipping past. If you want an explanation, then I'm afraid I don't have one. Alright, this video is starting to get a little too long for my taste, and I still need to do an overall conclusion, so let's just have a quick fire round. In no particular order of the final missions, we have Fast Line, Japan again, in a subway station this time. Terrace blows stuff up, and you have to chase after schoolgirls and rescue them, I guess, maybe. You get a rod shield this time, so that's cool. And yes, the trains presumably still run on time. And for some reason, you get the title screen. Again, I'm even more confused now. Pipe Dream. Spetsnaz in the desert. All your feral shooter men die in the first minute. Very cool. Oh man, he's dead. You blow stuff up indiscriminately, shoot all the tourists, and then rescue two people. I do wonder why they needed you, since they can apparently teleport. Oh well. Oh my god, what the fuck? Truth in chaos. Back to Japan, there's an evil cult of weeds that want to gas all the gaijin. There are many men to shoot, and a lot of hostages to save. Also, there are instant game over laser traps. Also, also, the Japanese commander keeps yelling at me, for no reason. I hate being Japanese. Run. Okay, fine, we can be in Japan for one more mission. This time, it's us assassinating some random person, just shooting them through the window with a sniper rifle. Okay, sure, why not? I'm sure this is how the Japanese police do things all the time. As the title says, you have to run to evac. 
This was supposed to be a helicopter rescue, but jokes on you, it gets shot down. How unpredictable. As is tradition with these Japanese levels, I got a little confused as to where to go. I did find my bearings after a short while though, and a few rooftop jumps later, I got to the ice cream van that the Japanese police use as an evac vehicle. Goodbye, Japan. Sandstorm, back to British we go, one last time. It's another desert mission where your friends die instantly. You're here to stop the manufacturing plant belonging to the evil Arabic potion sellers or something like that. And again, just a, just a bit of stealth. Just a little bit of stealth. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's not gonna be any more stealth after this. Right? Oh, and there's a nuke launcher too, because of course we needed that one more time just to finish off the whole series. Miami Heat. Miami freaking Heat. This is a bank high stealth mission. You start off on a surface at a police blockade and have to infiltrate the bank itself using the sewers with two other SWAT members. Except, they go in before you. And I guess they take a different path because you don't meet them until you arrive at the entrance to the bank. The first part of the mission consists of running around the sewer, doing some basic puzzles involving electricity and water, and I really want to know where the hell the other two guys went. Doing all that, you get to the bank, and that's where the fun begins. You get to deal with one guard, who keeps crossing the same hallway, while escorting civilians from around the bank. It's not difficult, but it is rather boring. Or at least, that's just how I find stealth to be, and the fact that this isn't even a stealth game doesn't help. Also, the game gives you silenced weapons. Why can't I just shoot him? Or run up and stab him in the back? The game says that this would make too much noise, but really? Now we're going to be realistic about suppressed weapons and not actually being Hollywood silent? There's a bit of action when you rescue a woman from the vault. You do get to shoot the guy holding her hostage, because apparently the other bandits won't hear your gun going off in there, I guess. Oh well, anyway, you do all that and then you get to the lobby, where the rest of the bad men are. The SWAT rebels in, shoots everyone, and then you win. And they play this guy up as a boss encounter, but he dies in like three shots. LOL. And that's it. That is officially it. No credit roll this time, but that's the end of the deleted scenes. So then, does this game still hold up? Well... Playing again after all these years, it's clear that it can't really hold up to your average modern FPS. If you take away the novelty of it being Counter-Strike, you're left with an okay-ish Call of Duty light. And that was when the game was released. I still value the deleted scenes for the nostalgic factor, but without roast and glasses, it's hard to point to anything specific that Zero does, which other games of its time don't do better. The combat starts to get repetitive after a while, your selection of guns is limited, and there's no other mechanics to really bite your teeth into. No advanced movement, no abilities, just standing still and shooting the standing man twice in the face. The occasional self section or planting a bomb isn't exactly going to blow your pants off. If you want an exciting shooter with decent graphics, fun guns, interesting gameplay elements and challenging enemies, and all of that from a game released in the same time period, just play Fear. It released barely a year later and you'd probably get more enjoyment out of it. I did enjoy revisiting one of my childhood classics, it was a fun trip down the memory lane, but if you're someone who has no attachment to this game, you might find it to be lacking. Occasionally, it did something which made me go, oh, that's cool, but the number of cool moments can be counted on one hand. It's a very interesting time capsule. If you can get it in a bundle for like 5 bucks and you're interested in the genre, then sure, you can get a fun evening out of it. Fuck, shit, 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 shit. Hey, maybe it's sitting in your library, untouched, right now, and maybe once in a while you wondered if the whole deleted scenes Counter-Strike thing was like a weird documentary on the making of Counter-Strike or something. Well, now you know what it is, and maybe you too will play or have played a game for yourself and share my feelings on the game. Or maybe you disagree with me and think that it belongs into a Hall of Fame. You probably aren't the only one in the world, and if you can get a time machine and speak to a 6 year old me, then there will be at least two of you. But for the average person, if you want a real fun FPS to play through, then I recommend looking somewhere else. If you want to play Counter-Strike multiplayer, then hey, any of the other games are far more alive. And that's about the end of it. Thanks for sticking around. This whole thing was basically just me looking into the past. I hope you don't feel baited by thinking this was going to be a deep philosophical retrospective with a moral lesson at the end. So, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you can be bothered. And I'll see you next time with like a 15 minute gameplay video or something.